A reading from the Song of Songs. Set me as a seal on your heart, as a seal on your arm. For stern as death is love, relentless as the netherworld is devotion. Its flames are, are a blazing fire. Deep waters cannot quench love, nor floods sweep it away. Were one to offer all he owns to purchase love, he would be roundly mocked. Verbum Domini. Young men and women, praise the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord from the high heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all you his angels. Praise him, all you his host. Yeah. Let the kings of the earth and all peoples, the princes and all the judges of the earth, young men too and maidens, old men and boys, praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has lifted up the horn of his people. Be this his praise from all his faithful ones, from the children of Israel, the people close to him. Alleluia. Dominus Vobiscum. Et cum Spiritu Tuo. Lexia Sancti Evangelis Secundum Luca. Gloria Jesus entered a village where a woman whose name was Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat beside the Lord at his feet listening to him speak. Martha, burdened with much serving, came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me by myself to do the serving? Tell her to help me. The Lord said to her in reply, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part and will not be taken from her. Verbum do homini. Today we celebrate the memorial of Saint Scholastica. She died around 543. She was uh, the blood sister of St. Benedict, and she founded and governed a large uh, community of sisters, I guess at some point named the Benedictine Sisters, uh, near Monte Cassino, where St. Benedict was. And St. Gregory the Great 
wrote that she devoted herself to God from her childhood and that her pure soul went to God in the likeness of a dove, as if to show that her life had been, the, had been the, enriched with the fullest gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's a wonderful account we read in the Office of Readings every year about St. Benedict meeting with his sister and then she dying the next day. They had this conversation all night and he had a vision of her soul leaving her body like a dove flying up to heaven. So she was a consecrated religious, a sister, made vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And the church has these readings selected today in honor of her and the memorial. And we hear in the gospel that the story we know well of Martha and Mary and the gentle rebuke, I think, from Jesus of Martha that she's overly anxious. I mean, they have to eat a meal. She's performing hospitality. Martha invites him to the home. Those are all good, beautiful things, but, um, you know, I think the idea is that she was too caught up in it and needed to make some time uh, for Jesus. And he says, there is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part and will not be taken from her. It's a very natural scene. You can almost feel the tension of between you know, Martha and Mary there and, <clears throat> and Jesus. I think it's a gentle rebuke of Martha, and, but points out that you know, Mary is sitting at his feet, attentive to him, listening to his words, and this is the better part. St. Paul praises virginity. He doesn't command it. He speaks of the time growing short, immediate distress that we're in. He could be speaking of an imminent second coming or just the persecution of the church, the difficulties therein. But he, he says the unmarried woman or virgin is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit, that they have chosen the better part. He doesn't command celibacy, virginity. And he praises marriage, obviously, but he also praises virginity. And we can see in the life of the consecrated virgin, it's directed to a loving communion with the Lord himself directly, the one thing necessary. And this images the church in a special way. The church is the bride of Christ. It images the church at her deepest reality. And women religious in particular image this reality in a special way. The church is bride, dedicated to the Lord, imaging the holiness, the dedication, the communion, even the spousal union we are to have with the Lord. It's really kind of a striking thing when the scriptures speak of Israel as the bride and God as the, the bridegroom. You know, what salvation, what holiness, what the call, the vocation that we all have is, you know, this union with God. It's a it's powerful when you pause and think about it, what the Lord has done. That's taken to a, a preeminent, deepest reality with the incarnation, that the bridegroom has, has appeared, he's come. And today, through faith, through the sacraments, we can have this union. We can come and adore the Lord. We could receive him in communion. And that union is fostered that union with Christ and his mystical body is fostered, is grown, you know, with every reception of communion. So everyone is called to love God with all their heart strength, our heart, soul, mind, and strength, in you know, both of the vocations to marriage and virginity um, can inform the other, can, uh, can help one another, can enrich the other. Virginity showing preeminently this dedication to the Lord. I think marriage imaging love, the vocation to love that we have, loving the love of the spouses, love of the children, the sacrifices therein and raising children and, and having a lifelong commitment to another. It's a beautiful image of the relationship we are to have with God. It's not coming and going, it's permanent. It's this dedicated life to him. 
In the Old Testament, we see an emphasis on God as transcendent, holy, other than. You know, even the temple, you know, it wasn't the permanent dwelling of the Lord at times that cloud of glory would descend on it. No house made of human hands, we're told in scripture, can contain the Lord. So God is seen as transcendent. And that to be holy was to be set apart for the Lord himself. That God sets apart his people for himself, a particular race, you know, a chosen people, we're told in the scriptures. And this is true for the new covenant as well. First Peter says, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation called out of darkness into the light of Jesus, called out of the world to be holy, to be God's people, and to be dedicated to him. So in the new covenant, the vocation to celibacy is to be set apart, to be preoccupied with God and the things of the Lord. It's a vocation, it's a state in life, it's a, a stable life where a person can come and live these vows, usually in community. It's God's initiative. He chooses whom he wills. He gives them a gift, rooted in baptism, to live the vow of, of celibacy. It's an answer to what God wants from the person in their life. It's a, it's a total, as Father Thomas DeBay would write, it's a total love matter. It's not temporary, but it's permanent. You make vows into being a, a consecrated religious. Celibacy, virginity for the kingdom is a way of living the new creation in Christ, called to this union, called to be joined, transformed, sharing in the divine nature. Second Peter speaks of being partakers of the divine nature. And spousal imagery that's used in both the Old and New Testament expresses this self-gift of love. More than any other language you know, we could have to describe it, I think. Jesus himself speaks of, in Matthew 19, of celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes in the world, it's seen as just about work or availability. You, know, you don't have a marriage, you don't have a spouse and family, so you can work for the church. But it's more than that. It's about you know, that being comes before doing. It's about fostering this union with Christ, removing anything, any obstacle or hindrance to that union to be dedicated to the Lord. And again, Father Dubay writes that the primary reason for consecrated virginity is not work to be done, but a deep prayer communion to be achieved. You know, Mary at the foot of Jesus. We can see that. It's a beautiful image of that. The Code of Canon Law speaks of re religious as their first duty as the contemplation of divine things and an assiduous union with God in prayer is the first and principal duty of all religious. That being comes before doing. That fostering, living out this union becomes as before any activity. And Saint Scholastica and these saints who live this life our model for us in being wholly dedicated to the Lord and generously following him and serving him. And there's a radiance to it. There's a radiance of holiness that I think inspires all of us. You know, sometimes we lose that confidence, that holiness, that transformation is really possible. When we look in the lives of the saints who had a fallen human nature, weaknesses and struggles like we do, you know, they have achieved this holiness by the grace of God, and they leave us a powerful witness, a powerful call. That they lived fulfilled lives. They lived lives of beauty, of holiness, of service. And may we follow in their example.